the all. We've been joined by Sri Jain Sinha. Uh, Sri Jain Sinha is the chairperson of the Standing Committee of Finance, Parliament of India, BJP Lok Sabha, member of parliament from Hazari Bag, Jharkhand. During his time as a minister, Mr. Sinha gained wide recognition and innovation and result-oriented policymaker with singular successes ranging from legislation that brought in India game-changing bankruptcy code to establishing India's sovereign wealth. Mr. Sinha was partner at Omdiar Network and the managing director of Omdiar Network India Advisors. Before joining Omdiar Network, he, he was the managing director at Courage Capital Management. Mr. Sinha's getting to the green frontier development model is gaining broad acceptance as a net zero pathway for India in the 21st century. On this note, I'd like to invite him to share his thoughts on accelerating climate action in India. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, very glad to join you for this session. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you all in person. I would have very much liked to be. Uh, but I'm in the middle of some very interesting uh, discussions on a global climate alliance, which is why I can't be in Mumbai. Uh, but I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. So uh, a very uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, and uh, what uh, I would like to do uh, over the next few minutes, and perhaps if we can make uh, the logistics work, uh, is to also take a few questions from all of you. Uh, but what I would like to discuss with all of you is some of the work we've been doing uh, on how we can establish a global alliance to accelerate climate action. Uh, now, uh, just to give you a quick background on this, uh, as you know, through the G7, uh, Germany has taken the initiative to uh, announce the formation of a climate club. Of course, many people would like to call it a climate alliance, uh, as would, uh, would uh, us, uh, but the Germans like the term climate club a lot, and uh, they are uh, pressing forward with that, with that initiative. Uh, and of course, uh, Chancellor Scholz is coming to India uh, on uh, on February the 25th. And the idea of the Climate Club, the Global Climate Alliance, is going to be very much on top of the agenda. So this is very live. Uh, of course, the Americans are also uh, very eager that uh, a climate alliance of some sort should be put together. Uh, and this is what we on the Indian side through the G20 process as well uh, have been uh, have been advocating. Uh, but essentially, uh, the three key messages here, uh, folks, uh, is that we need a climate alliance that can accelerate the flow of trillions of dollars of capital from the north to the south. Uh, if we don't have a climate alliance that basically lays down certain standards, certain approaches and reduces through blended finance the risk of climate uh, investing in the global south, we are not going to get much traction on reducing uh, our uh, carbon levels and so on. And as you all know, of course, uh, this is an existentialist issue, not just uh, for uh, the North, but much more so for the global South, uh, particularly South Asia, as you know, is very, very vulnerable uh, to climate change. And this is going to require trillions of dollars. I'll get into it in some detail, but unless we massively re-engineer the global financial system, we are not going to be able to enable these trillions of dollars to flow from the North to the South. And that's why we need some very systemic, very high-level interventions uh, to do that. Uh, the recent uh, decision by the World Bank President David Malpas to resign by June 30th opens up a very interesting window for massive restructuring of the MDBs to enable that to happen. And we really have a historic opportunity right now, uh, starting with Chancellor Scholz's visit, going into the G20 to actually enable uh, a pretty historic uh, climate alliance to happen. So those are the key messages that I wanted to share with you all. Let's go to the next page. Now, as you all know, I have been advocating this uh, for quite some time, but let me once again repeat uh, that net zero is net positive for India and certainly for the global south. Uh, and really the important thing to consider here is what's the baseline. So by and large, when you talk to economists, uh, they really haven't factored in what is going to happen over the next 20 or 30 years in terms of climate change, the impact it's going to have on heat waves, on sea level rise, on extreme weather. When you look at all of that, the, the, the fundamental sort of baseline assumption for India of 5 to 6% long-term GDP growth is very questionable because the impact can be quite dire. And so if we have to consider the baseline, the baseline should be far lower than 5 to 6%. 
maybe two or three percent. And in in that uh, analysis, if we are able to protect five, six, seven percent GDP growth by moving to net zero very quickly, obviously the delta will be very positive. Net zero will be very positive. And all the modeling, not just you know from the modeling work that I did about two years ago, uh, but all the more recent modeling work that's been done uh, by uh, McKinsey, by uh, the Asia Society, and others. Everybody is indicating that net zero is going to be net positive. And of course, uh, from an air pollution point of view, it's also going to make a very big difference. And particularly for India as an energy importer, where we are in, importing two hundred and fifty billion dollars a year. Two hundred and fifty billion dollars a year, which is out of our six hundred billion dollar import bill, uh, getting a better balance of payments and energy security is a very high uh, objective, very important objective for us. Next page. Now, the other thing that's very interesting to understand uh, about net zero is that when you look at the commitments that global north countries have already made and China has made, they have pretty much committed legally. That they will be at net zero by 2050. China also, and I was just at a recent OECD conference in Paris, where the Chinese uh, minister explicitly and once again uh, formally committed to peaking in the next few years and being down to net zero by 2060. So China and the global north are getting to net zero, and here you know we are still showing some emissions from them. But essentially, it's the global south that's going to be the Major emitter going forward, and by 2050, it's going to be 66 percent of emissions. India being a very big contributor to that, and eventually, it's going to be you know 70, 80 percent of total emissions uh, in the century as we move forward. And as you can see today, we are emitting about 55 billion tons of uh, carbon uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, gases, carbon equivalents, but it's not going down very much. So it's still over 40 billion uh, till 2100. Because the global south is going to be unable to reduce carbon emissions. Okay. Now I don't know if you've been following uh, the more recent predictions of what is going to happen to uh, temperatures and what's going to happen to climate change if we stay at these levels of carbon emissions. But they are getting increasingly day by day much more dire because there is a very high sense that of the four or five major global tipping points, if we continue at these emission levels, we are going to trigger. You know the Arctic and the Antarctic melting. We're going to trigger permafrost melting. We're going to trigger major ocean currents uh, collapsing. And therefore, if we continue at these emissions uh, that people are projecting right now, we are going to have some very, very dire consequences. And all of this really is dependent now on the global south in terms of reducing emissions. Next page. The problem, of course, for the global south and India here is an example. Is that the level of investments, and this is where I think you'll all find it very interesting. The level of investment that's required in the global south uh, is way beyond the capacity of the global south to finance. So here's an example of India. This is based on you know very solid data that we've got from uh, the chief economic advisor. Uh, we uh, are running at private sector capex, much of which you all are funding, at about sixty-five billion dollars a year. That's gone up in the last uh, quarter or so. We may well be at a seventy to eighty billion dollar a year private sector capex number. But all the modeling, and again, as I said, we've looked at many different modeling studies. All the modeling is showing us that we need to be between fifty to a hundred billion dollars a year of private sector capex. Forget public sector, of private sector capex, because if you look at the power sector, you look at steel, you look at cement, you look at fertilizers, you look at real estate. All of these very important emitting sectors are largely driven by private sector investment, not by public sector investment. And the private sector itself uh, has to put in 60 billion a year in the power sector, which is of course for renewables as well as for distribution, transmission, uh, and so on. So we are looking at uh, investment requirement for India, which of course is largely dependent on foreign capital. Uh, which is well beyond our ability to do. As I said, we're doing, you know, 65 to 80 billion dollars right now. We have to add another 50 to 100 billion dollars more to be able to get on a net zero 2070 decarbonization pathway. Those are the the the, the numbers that uh, that are coming uh, coming out. Now, obviously, no one had done any of this analysis before. You know, I and a research team worked on it. 
but then we have validated it with several other uh, research teams uh, including uh, at mckinsey and uh, at uh, the asia society so these numbers are, are looking quite uh, quite uh, solid uh, but of course what they mean for us is that you know we really have to do something dramatic uh, to be able to get on a net zero 2070 pathway next page so what we are proposing uh, as part of uh, this climate club climate alliance idea uh, is that we will have two groups of uh, countries the group a countries will take on targets that are not as demanding so not net zero by 2050 let's say net zero by 2070 the group b countries uh, which is uh, countries uh, like uh, the eu like uh, uh, the us and otherwise those are recording all recording in progress those are all going to have to get to net zero by 2050 even more quickly and at the same time work really hard in terms of financial and technology flows uh, to be able to uh, help the group a countries uh, uh, the less uh, the less uh, ambitious countries the countries from the global south in terms of getting to net zero so we need to really segregate two different groups of countries group b countries group a countries and then we have to go sector by sector so whether it's steel whether it's cement whether it's fertilizers to be able to get aligned pathways between steel companies in europe and the us and steel companies in india and elsewhere and once we have these aligned pathways then we can also avoid uh, you know mechanisms like the c ban so there's a lot of work going on at a sectoral level where we're trying to figure out how we can uh, come up with these aligned transformational pathways and this entire set of arrangements is going to be part of the climate alliance climate, climate club uh, framework that we are working on next page but core to the whole framework is a completely revamped global financing system we know that the global north has the capital that the global north uh, in fact uh, can unlock you know uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of private sector capital flows from the north to the south but the mdbs and the dfis have a very important role to play in risk management in direct investments and then on the global south side we need local green agencies authorities that can help a whole host of uh, financial intermediaries in the global south uh, to get more capital to get uh, everything that is required to really accelerate capital flows so uh, i'll get to some of the risk management instruments that we are discussing right now but we really also at the same time need to do two important things from an enabling point of view one is we need to get global standards on what is green and what is not green and then we need to get these sectoral pathways uh, lined up uh, at the same time we need to make sure that there is enough capital flowing into these blended finance instruments so that we can really get these trillions of dollars of private sector capital to flow but we are not talking about substantially more budgetary resources budgetary resources from the global north are limited and will remain limited it's all about mobilizing private sector capital mobilizing effectively what you all do so this is going to be i think for for the entire venture capital private equity industry uh, really the story of the next decade which is green investing and unlocking the resources to pursue green investment and the kind of capital flows that you're going to see i think are going to uh, really be much much bigger than the ones that we've seen in the digitization digital space and they have to be otherwise uh, we don't have a chance next page so here are the kinds of numbers that we are talking about on the left hand side we have uh, funds that will be required for adaptation and resilience that is to deal with the damaging consequences of climate change on the right hand side are mitigation instruments that are intended for uh, investments so uh, there are various things that are being talked about for retiring coal and for enabling coal uh, to uh, to uh, uh, be shut down coal mines to be closed those are the just energy transition programs there already work has started with indonesia with south africa those numbers are 25 to 50 billion dollars a year loss and damage which is uh, something that has been agreed upon now through cop 27 uh, is uh, about 10 to 20 billion dollars annually the climate innovation fund is a research uh, fund that we are proposing that would be 5 to 10 billion dollars and then on the blended finance mitigation side we are proposing things like a currency hedging facility a credit guarantee program to deal with first loss uh, type situations and something that i think all of you will appreciate 
uh, which is climate fund funds that could be done through the MDBs and the DFIs. So, for example, uh, if the IFC could do a billion dollar annually, a billion dollar annually fund of funds, where they could be the anchor investor in private equity or venture capital funds uh, that are looking to do green investment. Uh, so get IFC or other uh, such institutions to really step up and say, we're going to put a billion dollars a year as anchor investors into venture capital and private equity funds. Uh, so those are all uh, instruments, blended capital instruments that are being discussed right now. And these are all part of, uh, of the discussions that are happening at the highest level uh, in the G7 and the G20. Next page. So if we were to do that, uh, I think we would have a triple win, right? We'd have a win for the planet for sure, a win for the global north, and a win for the global south. I've already said that net zero is net positive for the global south. But for the global north also, if these trillions of dollars of capital do flow from the north to the south, It'll obviously help the, con the companies of the North because it's going to be their technology. It's going to help investors in the North because you're protecting their returns. It's going to create you know, more jobs, more competitiveness for the North. So the argument we are making for countries of the North is that it's absolutely uh, to your advantage to really, really push this and to make uh, this kind of a climate alliance happen. Next page. And just to, uh, just to emphasize this, uh, please recognize that the private sector capital flows that we're talking about here are private sector capital flows that are coming from the north. So any return guarantees, any loss guarantees, any hedging facilities, all of these are going to protect investors from the north. And it's, uh, it's something that will really help the countries of the global north. Obviously, it creates a lot of jobs. We just saw the terrific aviation order that was placed by uh, Air India. That's going to, for example, create lots and lots of jobs in the global north. And similarly, all these green technologies uh, going into electric mobility, into green hydrogen, uh, renewable energy systems, all of these are going to create jobs in the north as well. So to think that this is something where you are helping the south and the north is not getting out of anything out of it is actually not correct. This is absolutely going to help the companies and investors of the global north over the next 20 or 30 years and, of course, be a big win for the planet. Next page. So the way we are working on this within the G20 process uh, is we are trying to finalize uh, uh, really the whole uh, coming together of the climate club idea that Germany has been advocating, the climate alliance idea that we have been advocating, establishing working groups at a sectoral level, which would be within the B20, uh, to really take forward this idea of sectorally aligned pathways, uh, then have these consultations, and then develop a proposal uh, that would, you know, standardize instruments, come up with blended finance approaches, uh, commit sufficient funds, restructure the MDBs and DFIs. So there's a full work plan uh, that we have developed and which we are following through, through the T20 process, the B20 process, and the Sherpa track. So this is all part of the G20 process that is underway right now. Final uh, page. And so, uh, you know, obviously we have been working on this uh, and we've had many rounds of consultations already, and our hope, and we'll have to see whether we can pull this off, uh, is that there is an important announcement at the G20 summit in Delhi in September, uh, where, uh, you know, this climate club stroke climate alliance idea uh, is uh, formalized. We have a number of countries that participate, and we can, uh, we can really then uh, highlight how important and powerful this is going to be for the world. So I'll stop here. These are the charts I had. Happy to take any questions you all might have. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Um, I have a question which um, um, is a specialized area of carbon trading. Because you're involved in these discussions in uh, various fora, where do you see carbon trading, progress in carbon trading in the years ahead? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And obviously, we are trying to also, as part of the Climate Alliance, come up with mechanisms that will enable us to clear a global market for carbon credits or carbon emissions. So we are trying to do that as well. 
as you know, the EU has a pretty effective ETS emissions trading system now with carbon allowance, allowances uh, that are now trading at about 80 to 90 euros per ton. So they've established a pretty liquid uh, high volume market uh, as far as carbon uh, emissions are concerned. And ultimately, what we would like to be able to do is to be able to clear the market for this globally uh, so that if there is a, a mitigation opportunity uh, in India, then that should be compared on a level playing field with the mitigation opportunity in South Africa, in the US uh, and in Germany. So that's where we would like to go. Uh, there are good uh, sort of uh, frameworks to build on the EU one, for example, the Chinese one also is now functioning. And we have introduced the legislation for this to the energy conservation bill as well. But this will have to be part of the overall solution. That's right. Jain, this is Vineet. Lovely yeah, I Vineet. See, lovely to see you. Uh, I, uh, we are actually going to be talking about voluntary carbon markets. Uh, I think we discussed last time. Uh, we, Avishkar itself is trying to raise a $300 million fund to not only look at India as a potential area, and uh, uh, I probably think it's one of the best ways to attract global capital to take to the poorest in, in, in the country and then actually try to uh, trade in carbon credits even after leaving some benefit sharing for the, for the farmers. What is your general uh, consensual view coming on around voluntary? So, Vineet, I, 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 I am a believer in carbon trading in carbon markets, but to my mind, it's not low-hanging fruit. I think we could put $100 billion into India on other industries where we have, you know, enormous low-hanging fruit, whether it's in electric mobility, rooftop solar, solar uh, in uh, agricultural applications, uh, whether it is energy conservation, we have, we have so many opportunities where we could easily put $100 billion to work with really high quality commercial returns, even today. Uh, and so, I mean, I would, I would expect IBCA uh, to really be out, uh, you know, evangelizing the notion, as I said, that if we had, you know, massive amounts of fund of fund capital available to be anchor investors, you would be able to deploy you, Vinny should be making the case of how you can deploy a billion dollars if you had $250 million of anchor investment. That's what you should be arguing. And your friends and colleagues uh, sitting there should be uh, making the same argument. Because this is going to be the biggest investment opportunity of our lifetimes. And if we get it wrong, I mean, I don't know what we'll, future we'll be creating for our children. So this is really, really important, folks. Really important. Which is why I have dedicated the last four years of my life to really advancing this set of ideas. I'm very pleased to say that we have made very significant progress. But we need particularly the venture capital, private equity industry in India to step forward and say, yes, we have a pipeline of commercially viable, and I'm not talking about impact in this, commercially viable $100 billion worth of opportunities. How much would it cost to build a charging network in India? Has anyone estimated that? That has to be done through private sector capital. What if we were to put solar trees in you know, India's uh, you know, sort of agricultural areas where you could still grow crops. Uh, Professor Ashok Gulati has already said that solar could be a third crop for Indian farmers. Who's done the economics on that and figured it out and told us how much money we need and shown that we can make commercial returns on it? This is here and now, folks. Carbon markets and carbon trading are all good. It's, it's bonus. But right now, I think there's $100 billion of private equity venture capital opportunity right now for you guys where I'd be beating down the doors of the IFC and others saying, you know, put in $250 million of anchor investment so we can make this happen. Yeah, I think uh, very pertinent points. And I think we have IFC, BI and all of them actually in the room somewhere. So we'll make sure. I think yeah, Nicholas is somewhere around. I will follow through. Yeah, find, find them, grab them. I have been, I have been beating. We are, of course, working at the, at the sort of you know, uh, MDB uh, restructuring level to completely change their approach. But we have to bo top down and bottoms up, we have to tell the story. You have to, because you see what I hear from them is where's the pipeline? Show me the pipeline, guys. Build the pipeline. Get the companies, again, whether it is, uh, you know, fleet, uh, electric fleets, whether it's solar trees, whether it is uh, pumped hydro, I can see so many opportunities. I just wrote an article in the Economic Times about this. I don't know if you all saw that. But, I mean, I can only sketch out ideas. It's you all have to take it and show here are the companies, here's the investment opportunity, 
and here's the huge payoff from a decarbonization perspective. That's work you all have to do. So let me actually assure you on behalf of IVCA EC that uh, we are going to push it very hard. I think uh, uh, we at Avishkar ourselves are actually launching our first one and I'll, I'll hopefully love to take it to a billion dollar but right now uh, ambitious 250, 300 billion is where I'll go. But I think as you rightly pointed out, the opportunity is probably much, much larger than any of us are visualizing and probably we'll have to look at it from a different context. So Yeah, so Vineet, again, I will repeat it and I'm... Uh, I'm sort of a, 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 a radical in this. Uh, the time for incrementalism is over. Please study the climate science you need. The time for incrementalism is over. We have to be radical now. Every day we are losing, we are losing time. I, I agree. Day. I agree with that very sobering thought, uh, Jayan. Thank you so much. For okay, let me and, uh, and yeah, Vineet, let me just Good. emphasize. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know what happened in Pakistan? They lost 20% of their GDP last year, 20%. They're in a full-blown macroeconomic meltdown right now because of climate change, full-blown. <laughs> this is very serious, you know. Jayan, good afternoon. This is Anjali. Hi. I don't know if you can see me. But uh, thank you so much, as always, for your very, very inspiring words and, and your ideas. As you know, all of us have been avid followers of the Green Frontier that you laid out for us a couple of years ago. So, a couple of points here. One is, completely agree with you. Point, time for incremental is done. Uh, in some ways, we are very optimistic because India has leapfrogged twice on telephony and digital payments. We have got UPI, we have got Aadhaar, and we have got the lowest cost data network. So, we do believe, and we are seeing founders believe that as well, that the climate solutions that come from India will be built for India, but for the world. So, we don't necessarily have to look to others, to the north or the west, for example, to bring solutions here. You talked about pipeline. At Havana, we are seeing 200 opportunities every quarter. Outstanding founders who are devoting their life to building this. The question really that we are now starting to see across the ecosystem is informed capital. Whether it is, uh, I think there's a lot of money available for late stage and public markets, uh, large companies are able to raise global capital, whether it's a Renew or a Tata Power and so on. But for early stage, mid stage companies, the combination of equity and debt a lot of those products don't exist today. Uh, and there is policy support, but how do we accelerate the transition from policy and intent to actual capital flowing into, whether it is into funds or into companies? No, you're exactly right, Anjali. And that's the top-down pressure that we are applying. Uh, a lot of it is on the MDBs and DFIs so that they really step up. As I said, I have been Telling the IFC, I just uh, did an event with Vivek Patak, who's responsible for all of climate business at the IFC. And I told him that, you know, they should be doing a billion dollar fund of funds on an annual basis. And he said, no, no, I'll take it forward very seriously and so on. So there's some of that. There's some of that. But ultimately, uh, we need, uh, you know, support at the head of state level. And we need to be able to say that we do have a global climate alliance where the global north will really, uh, you know, unlock these trillions of dollars. Uh, and that's the top-down pressure we need to create in terms of blended finance. And I think what you all can continue to do, as you're doing so well, Anjali, is to be able to uh, show that the pipeline exists, that if we had more capital, then this is the kind of investing we would be able to do, and these are the kinds of solutions uh, that we would be able to unlock. And you're exactly right, those would be solutions that are India specific, but obviously uh, can scale from India. Hello, Jayant. Nishit here. How are you? I'm well, thank Nishit. You, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, just a quick question. When there is a lot of talk, hype, and a lot of funding talks, one thing we need to be careful about greenwashing. I think that should not uh, tarnish the name of the country and uh, some kind of framework we need to put in place so that, you know, people do not take this uh, whole agenda on a right because green no, you're right and and there is a there is a DA effort that's underway uh, on establishing a green taxonomy and saying here's what's green here's what's not green so there's been a fair bit of work already in that regard uh, this of course has to get resolved at a global level uh, so we need to have global standards because if India comes up with its own set of standards and those are not accepted by global north financial institutions, then that becomes a problem. So we really need global standards here, and this is part of the global 
climate club climate alliance framework where we have working groups that quickly establish these standards and are able to define very clearly uh, what's in and what's out so we are working on that top down as well an issue that is part of the uh, climate alliance framework that is that is being discussed right now and the g20 wonderful thank you so much Minister Sir, Rajathia, thank you very much. Again, you're always very supportive of uh, IVCA and you're always there. So hopefully next time we'll see you in person uh, rather than this uh, virtual world. And thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.